All right, so welcome to Unit 2, Classical Civilizations. This covers the time period from 600 BCE to 600 CE, or Before Common Era to Common Era. Um, so we're going to talk about several major classical empires of this time period. Okay, if you look at the map, the major empires you have, you've got your Mayans in North America, you have your Romans over in Europe. You also have the Greeks in Europe. Um, you also have the Phoenicians on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, you also have the Persians over in the Middle East. You have India, who have the Mauryans and the Guptas. And you also have China, which is generally the Chins and the Hans. You have several major cities, um, which we'll talk about just a little bit later. And... A big focus of this time period is how the empires rose and how they came to fall as well, and the reasons that they came to fall. Key concepts. So your first key concept is 2.1, which is the development and codification of religious and Now, what this is all about, as the states and empires increased and grew, and you've got contacts becoming more common between the regions, you have religious and cultural systems moving and being transformed by these new beliefs. They provided a bond among people and an ethical code with which to live by. And these shares be shared beliefs also influenced and reinforced the political, economic, and occupational stratification, or the different classes, if you want to call it that. And you've got religious and political authority merging as rulers. A lot of them were considered divine or appointed by the heavens or the gods. They used religion along with military and legal structures in order to justify their rule and make sure that it kept continuing. And the religious and belief systems could also create conflict. A large reason was because the beliefs and practices varied greatly, like, within and among the different societies. Because as they moved, they adapted to the cultures that are... So, codifications and further developments of existing religious traditions provided a bond among the people and an ethical code to live by. So, Judaism and Hinduism were already in existence before this period started, but we're going to see differences now in the religions and more of a codification or a set of rules and laws that you're going to see throughout the religion no matter where you are, even though there are going to be different like little nuances between each of the, each of the sections. We'll start with Judaism, and the association of monotheism with Judaism also further developed the codification of the Hebrew scriptures or the holy books, which also reflected the influence of the Mesopotamian culture and legal traditions, because remember, Judaism was founded in the same area as Mesopotamia near the Jordan River Valley. You have the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Roman empires conquering a lot of the Jewish states at different points in times. Unfortunately, the Jews have had a very, very long and difficult history. These conquests against the Jewish meant that the Jewish people moved out and had diasporic communities where there were groups and groups of Jews living throughout the Middle East and Europe and anywhere in this major area. And these diasporic communities were basically just communities where Jews lived together. So again, Judaism, monotheistic. Founder was Abraham and founded in the Jordan River Valley area. Their moral code was the Ten Commandments. And its holy book is the Torah, or the first five books of the Old Testament of the Bible. Hinduism now. Their core beliefs were outlined in the Sanskrit scriptures, which form the basis of the Vedic religions, which were later became known as Hinduism. And this contributed to the development of the social and political roles of a caste system 
and the importance of multiple manifestations of Brahma to promote the teachings of reincarnation. So if we remember correctly, the Vedic religions came from the Aryans as they came into India, and they kind of morphed into what we now know as Hinduism. So Hinduism is henotheistic, which means there's one God who takes multiple forms. Brahma is that main form and then gets broken down into multiple forms. It was founded in India by the Aryans. Their holy books were the Vedas and the Upanishads, which were written in Sanskrit. And their major beliefs were reincarnation, karma, which means that good deeds will follow you through reincarnation, moksha, which was enlightenment, and dharma, which was the duties of your caste. You also have new belief systems and cultural traditions emerging during this period, and they also spread. So you have Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, or Taoism, Christianity, and the Greek and Roman. First, we'll start with Buddhism. So the core beliefs about desire, suffering, and a search for enlightenment that was preached by the historic Buddha and collected by his followers in the sutras and scriptures were a reaction to the Vedic beliefs and rituals, like Hinduism and the caste system. The Buddhists didn't like that. So mostly Buddhism came from the people who were mostly hurt by the caste system. Think about it. That caste system meant you were stuck in that caste for life. Your children were stuck in that caste for life. Your grandchildren were stuck in that caste system and so on and so forth. So the people who were hurt the most by the caste system said, you know what? We don't necessarily believe in this caste system, but we believe in a lot of the things that like Hinduism preaches. So they kind of created Buddhism out of the new Aryan out of the Aryan beliefs and also the the local beliefs. Um, Buddhism changed over time as it spread throughout Asia, first through the support of the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, um, I hope you remember his name, and then through the efforts of missionaries and merchants and the establishment of educational teachings to promote Buddhism's core. So Buddhism started in India, but then spread to China and South Asia through the trade routes and Ashoka. And its founder was Siddhartha Gautama, which is now who we know as Buddha. Um, their beliefs are in the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path to Enlightenment. And Nirvana was their version of enlightenment, but they also believed in karma. Their sacred texts were the sutras, and... They spread not only to China, but to Korea and Japan as well, thanks to For Confucianism, Confucianism's core beliefs and writings originated with the writings and lessons of Confucius. They were elaborated by the disciples who then sought to promote social harmony by outlining the proper rituals and social relationships for all the people in China, including the rulers. So Confucianism was founded by, obviously, Confucius, and it was founded in China. Their major beliefs were that mostly that humans were good, um, not bad, and they had a strong respect for elders, which is known as filial piety. You also have a code of politeness, which is still used in Chinese society today. You have a strong emphasis on education, and you have ancestor worship, which are all still very important to China today. Confucianism was used as the basis for the, for the civil service exam in Chinese government, and you kind of have the scholar bureaucracy coming out of Confucianism, which we'll talk a little bit more about that later. For Taoism, in the major Taoist writings, the core belief of balance between humans and nature assumed that the Chinese political system would be altered indirectly. So because of their beliefs, they thought that the beliefs themselves would help to change Chinese government. Taoism also influenced the development of Chinese culture with multiple medical theories and practices, with poetry, with metallurgy, and with architecture. So it was founded by Lao Tzu, and the core beliefs were humility, a simple life, and inner peace, and harmony with nature. Uh, you have a 
also being founded in China. So you see the yin and the yang there up in the top left. You also see Laozi. Christianity was based on the core beliefs about the teachings on divinity of Jesus of Nazareth as recorded by his disciples, his followers, and it drew on Judaism and Roman and Hellenistic influences. Despite the initial Roman imperial hostility, Christianity spread through the efforts of the missionaries and merchants through many parts of Afro-Eurasia and eventually gained Roman imperial support by the time em Emperor Constantine came around, and he's the one who converted the Roman Empire to Christianity. So Christianity is also monotheistic. Its root religion was Judaism. It began in the Middle East. It was founded by Jesus of Nazareth, who happened to be a Jew. And their specific beliefs were that um, Jesus is the, the Messiah and the Son of God or the Savior, and a strong belief in the afterlife as well. Their holy book is the New Testament of the Bible, um, but they also build on that Old Testament from the Jews. Christianity is so highly drawn into Judaism as well because it is that root religion. Greco-Roman philosophy. So the core ideas in the Greco-Roman philosophy emphasize logic, um, empirical observation like science, and the nature of political power and hierarchy. Major Greco-Roman philosophers would be Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, and a focus on that logic. You can also see an emphasis on your uh, polytheism with the many gods as well. But the major focus in, Greco in Greek and Roman culture was this philosophy and using logic and what do we see in order to get what we want. Art and architecture also reflected the values of the religions and belief systems. In Hindu art and architecture, you can see the influences of the many different faces of Brahma and the different uh, purposes in life. Um, In Buddhist art and architecture, you can see the strong influences. Now, on the left image, you can see the strong Greco-Roman influences on Buddhism, uh, which happened early on in the centuries due to the trade routes. Um, on the right, you can see one of the uh, stupas, which was the holy shrines. So you can see one of the Indian stupas there on the right, and the middle picture is a carving in the middle of a stupa. In Christian art and architecture, you can see the influences of the Mediterranean. The people look more Mediterranean, and the art styles are a more Mediterranean art style. You have mosaics, um, which you can see pictured on the bottom middle there. In Greco-Roman art and architecture, you can see the columns, the strong, strong influence in Greco-Roman art. In architecture that we still see today. So on the left you see the Parthenon, which is probably the most iconic Greek building ever. Then on the right you can see the Greek and Roman columns pictured, and so you can see the Ionic, the Doric, the Corinthian. Um, you can see the bronze work there in the middle of the man throwing the discus. Uh, bottom left you can see the stone work there, uh, the, the porcelain in the bottom middle, and then you can also see artwork, ar the arch work in Roman history. That's an, a Roman aqueduct along with the arch. So belief systems generally reinforced existing social structures while also offering new roles and status to some men and some women even. I know it's rare, but some women. For example, Confucianism emphasized filial piety, again, that family respect. And then some Buddhists and Christians practiced a monastic life, which means they became monks. So the Buddhists didn't really have a spot for women in monk life, but Christians, they had female, like a version of female monks called nuns. So you've got females gaining some power there with Christianity. Other religious and cultural traditions, including shamanism, 
animism and ancestor veneration still persisted through this period um and they kind of got brought into the mainstream religions in Okay, key concept 2.2 is the development of states and empires. So these are our major places. So as the early states and empires grew in number and size and population, they frequently competed for resources and they came into conflict with one another. Obviously, if you're going to keep growing, you're, you're going to eventually run into other people, right? In their quest for land, wealth, and security, some empires expanded dramatically to huge empires. In doing so, they built a powerful military machine and administrative institutions that were capable of organizing these activities over long distances, aka a bureaucracy, and they created new groups of military and political elites to manage their affairs through this bureaucracy. As these empires expanded their boundaries, they also faced the need to develop policies and procedures to help govern these relationships with ethnically and culturally diverse peoples, um, sometimes to integrate them with an imperial society and sometimes to exclude them from that imperial society. In some cases, these empires became the victims of their own successes, uh, which would ultimately like lead to their downfall. By expanding their boundaries too far, they would create political, cultural, and administrative difficulties that they couldn't manage. They also experienced environmental, social, and economic problems when they overexploited their lands and their subjects and permitted excess of wealth to be concentrated in the hands of the privileged classes or the elites. So, First, you have the number and size of key states and empires grew dramatically as their rulers imposed political unity on areas where previously there had been competing areas. Your major key states, Persia, classical Chinese empires, classical Indian empires, classical Mediterranean empires, and the classical... First, you have the Persian Empire. At the dawn of the classical era, the Persian Empire was the most dominant empire on Earth. To this day, as a percentage of the Earth's population, the Persian Empire was the largest in history. The Persian Empire has emerged in Southwest Asia, which is now known as the Middle East, and the AP exam expects you to know all three of the Persian Empires. For the, These are the three names of them. You've got the Achaemenid, the Parthian, and the Sassanids. But just because the AP asks you to know all three of the names, don't worry. When it comes to the classical empires, the Persian is not one of the major empires. Those would be Rome, Gupta India, and Han China. But that being said, here is the major key information on the Persian empires because, yes, you are probably going to need to know them. So the Achaemenid, they were the green section that you see on the map. Then... The Parthian Empire, that was the yellow section, kind of focused in that area. Then the purple was the Sassan Sassanian Empire, which you can see focused there. The Royal Road was that road that passed through the Roman Empire. And you can see Greece over there on the left with the orange, just to give you kind of an idea for where. The Persian Empire. There's a lot of information on the Persian Empire, but here's your major stuff that you need to know. Cyrus the Great ruled from 550 to 530 BCE. Um, he was very tolerant, um, especially of other different languages and cultures. He helped create a bureaucracy and a major road system throughout the Persian Empire. Uh, he also believed in Zoroastrianism, which was monotheistic and had this basis of good versus evil. The empire ultimately fell with Alexander the Great in 330 BCE. Now for classical China, you have the Qin Dynasty outlined in purple. So where that was, it's outlined in purple. And then the Han Dynasty, that's in that orange color. And you can see the roads in the pinkish reddish color um, moving throughout the Chinese empire, basically. These are the major dynasties of China 
from Neolithic period all the way up to pretty much the end of the classical period. So the major ones that we're going to focus on during classical period is the Zhou, the Warring States period, the Qin, the Western Han, the Huns, obviously, the Eastern Han, and the Qin. So the Zhou Dynasty, they created the Mandate of Heaven, which was basically saying that if you, you were able to overthrow a dynasty if it was no longer serving the needs of the people. They also created a bureaucracy, and they believed in feudalism, where you had these elites, like dukes and lords, that would be owning property, and they would have the peasants working the property in exchange for living on the land. So your dynastic cycle, it starts with a new dynasty coming into power, the emperor reforms the government, makes it more efficient, the lives of the common people are improved and taxes are reduced and farming is encouraged, problems start to begin with wars and invasions, you move on to taxes getting increased to pay for all this fighting, farming gets neglected, the government starts to increase its spending and ultimately becomes corrupt, you have droughts, floods, famines. The poor start to lose respect for the government, and they join the rebels and attack the landlords. The rebel bands find a strong leader who helps to unite them. They attack the emperor. The emperor gets defeated, and ultimately a new dynasty comes to power. In the Qin Dynasty, it's ruled by Shi Wangdi. He is the first emperor, and he was a dictator. He believed in legalism, which said people were inherently bad. But he doubled the size of China during his dynasty. It was a very large bureaucracy in order to help rule this large place. He started to build the Great Wall. And he also had the terracotta warriors built to protect him in his death. The Qin Dynasty fell shortly after his death, but it was a strongly impactful dynasty. Then you have the Han Dynasty with your Confucian scholars who helped create the scholar gentry and the civil service system. That's that back to Confucianism right there. They helped connect the Silk Road. Um, so China became connected to the rest of the world with the Silk Road. Um, you also have public schools starting in the Han Dynasty and paper was created during the Han Dynasty. So a really influential dynasty for the Chinese. Most Chinese people when they think about classical China and who they feel they are most descended from, they tend to think of the Hans just because it was such an influential dynasty. Classical India, you have the Mauryan and the Gupta empires. So on the map, you can see the Mauryan empire was a much larger empire. It was that peachish color and the Gupta empire was smaller, but it, ended up running a lot more effectively. Classical India had an Aryan influence. So the Aryans entered India through the Khyber Pass, as you see in the arrows, the little red arrows on the map there. The Aryans brought the Vedas, which became the holy books of Hinduism. They also brought the caste system into India and Sanskrit, their written language. The Mauryan Empire was from 321 to 232 BCE. Its founder was Chandragupta Maurya. Obviously, that's where you get the name Mauryan Empire. They had a bureaucracy, which included a postal service. Ashoka, or Ahsoka, was the greatest ruler of the Mauryan. Um, he was Buddhist, and he practiced religious toleration of the Hindus in his empire. His missionaries were sent to spread Buddhism throughout the Silk Road, and they ultimately were the ones that spread it into China. There's, that's the big reason why Buddhism spreads as far as it did, was because of Ashoka and his missionaries. 
You have the edicts of Ashoka, which were laws that he had posted throughout the empire so that people could know them and read them. They were posted in multiple languages, too, so people could read them. Um, he was very advanced, and he was a very fair ruler. Unfortunately, the Mauryan Empire kind of fell apart after uh, Ashoka passed away. After a period of trouble and problems, you have the Gupta Empire rising in classical India, and it lasted from 320 CE to 647 CE. Its founder was Chandra Gupta I, who had no relation to the Mauryan dynasty whatsoever, just a common name. The Golden Age of India under Chandra Gupta II lasted from 375 to 415 CE. In this period, it was a great period for the Guptas. You have the concept of zero being created. You have the decimal system, pi, um, Arabic numerals in medicine. They had a vaccine against smallpox. I mean, their medicine was so incredibly advanced for that time period. You have the shtupas, which were the shrines. Um, you have Nalanda University to spread education, which was absolutely fantastic. All the great thinkers went to Nalanda University in India. And you have literature being created, too. Um, this period was absolutely wonderful for the Gupta Empire and for India as a whole. This is their classical period. In the Mediterranean, you have the Greeks and the Phoenicians, as you see on the map. The Phoenicians were largely a water group just due to the fact that there's not a whole lot of arable land where they were tending to live. And you've got the access of the Mediterranean Sea right there. And then you see the Grecians, how far they spread through the Mediterranean and the Black Seas. Um, so they had pretty influential uh, empires. On the right map, you have the Hellenistic world, which was most of Greece and what Persia brought and created through the, through the, Greek, the, through the Grecian um, and Hellenistic culture. Now, the main thing you need to know about Phoenicians is they gave us our alphabet. They gave us our first alphabet, um, and that's that's really the biggest thing. They were a seafaring empire, but their big, big thing was the alphabet. Greece, they were a mountainous and coastal empire, um, so you had the creation of Greek city-states that were independent from one another. You didn't have one unified country. You have free adult males being citizens, and in Athens, you had an aristocracy, a tyranny, and then finally a democracy. Um, remember, an aristocracy was a rule by um, your elite. Then you have tyranny, which was ruled by a dictator, and democracy was ruled by all. In Sparta, you had a military society that was ruled by an oligarchy, which was a rule by a few. And ultimately, for Sparta, it happened to be a military. Now, the big things you need to know about Greece were that the Persian Wars existed. Sparta and Athens actually teamed up versus Persia in the Persian Wars, and Greece won and got control of the Aegean Sea. In the Golden Age of Pericles, which fell after the Persian Wars, Pericles extended democracy to most adult males. You have Athens being rebuilt. The Parthenon was rebuilt, um, which was a shrine, basically, or a temple to um, Athena, the goddess. Um, you have the growth in sciences, art, architecture. This was their major period in Greece. Then, unfortunately, the Peloponnesian Wars came, where Sparta and Athens, they came against each other. Ultimately, that weakened the empire greatly, and you have the fall of Greece with Philip II and Alexander the Great coming in and conquering most of Greece from Macedonia and Persia. The Hellenistic Age started at this time, which was a blending of Greek, Persian, Egyptian, and Indian elements, and it was spread through trade thanks to Alexander the Great. Classical Mediterranean at its height for the Roman Empire, you see in red all over the map. They had a huge
In Rome, you had obviously the Italian peninsula and the Alps, which offered protection from the north. The Mediterranean Sea offered an option for commerce, and the Romans absolutely used it. The Romans adopted a lot of Greek culture and religion, so you'll see a lot of similarities between the two of them. And your two major groups of people in Rome were your patricians, which were your wealthy elites, and your plebeians, your average people. Picture there at the bottom is the Roman Forum, which again was the, the, the center for government within Rome. Um, it was the square where any government and major economic trades happened. For government, you've got a republic there. So it was representative. You, Your males, your free males, could vote on your representative, and they would go represent you. So you didn't have to go vote on everything like in Greece in that democracy, but you still got a say in the government by saying who you wanted to be your ruler. And then you have your 12 tables, which were the, codifi the codified laws, a standard set of laws for all of the Roman Republic. Again, forum, that was where all the government stuff happened in Rome. You had the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage for control of the Mediterranean Sea. Hannibal was a major Carthaginian general. Unfortunately, he lost. The Romans won, and they got control of the Mediterranean Sea. Remember, Carthage was back um, down in Africa across the Mediterranean Sea from Rome. Unfortunately, you have the death of the Roman Republic, which began with the rise of Julius Caesar. He came in, took over the government as a dictator. He tried to get rid of the Senate. Didn't work. He was stabbed by multiple senators. Unfortunately, the, he didn't leave any kind of set way to like have the government continue. I mean, the government could continue, but there was no clear way for a ruler to be selected after his death. So you had some floundering for a little while. But ultimately... The Roman Empire got created with Octavius... Octavian or Augustus becoming the first emperor appointed by the senators. Um, you have Pax Romana starting under Augustus with 200 years of Roman stability, and this was their golden age. You have Latin being created and spread during this time period, which most major, um, most major religions, or not most major religions, most major languages from in the world came from Latin. You have the Roman roads aqueducts, arches, the Colosseum being created, the Pantheon, which was very similar to the Parthenon, but it was for the Roman gods, um, Ptolemy and his, uh, his dis discoveries, public health um, being a huge, huge factor in Roman society. You were innocent until proven guilty um, under the Roman laws. We have a lot to thank the Romans for, um, and we can see their influence so strongly throughout our society still today. Unfortunately, you have the fall of the Roman Empire due to large weaknesses. You have Constantine converting to Christianity, which led to a distrust in the system of government because now people believed that they needed to worship the church and God, which was the way the Christian church worked, but that took away faith and money from the government of Rome. <coughs> Sorry. So your leaders... Your leaders lost a little bit of their power to the Christian church, and that caused some problems. Then, just from its sheer geographic size, it was huge. So it was very difficult to govern the whole thing. And unfortunately, because of that, you've got invasion um, from barbarians or nomads or whoever, and that caused weakening of the edges of the empire. And it's hard to, it's hard to kind of control all of that. Um... For economy, it's you had a lot of inflation going on with the money, and you also had the problem of people were refusing to pay their taxes because they just didn't want to. So it's hard to kind of run an empire when you don't have a whole lot of money coming in. Military, they started to have to hire out mercenaries, which were basically hired killers or hired soldiers, in order to fulfill their military and to like guard the whole empire because it was just so large. You had moral decay um, and a lot of people turning to Christianity to get away from that moral decay, which again took away from the authority of the emperor. 
political problems. You had corrupt leaders throughout the empire, and that helped weaken the authority of the emperor as well. And you have the division of the empire ultimately into moving the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome over to Constantinople, which was formerly known as Byzantium, but renamed by Constantine into Constantinople because he totally didn't have a big enough ego as it was already. Mesoamerica. That was the cl major classical civilization in the Americas. And you can see the Mayans and the Olmecs there on the map, but basically Mexico as we know it today, that's where the major civilizations were during that time. The Olmecs, they lacked a writing system, but they did build pyramid religious monuments. They disappeared around 400 BCE. Not really sure why a lot of their structures still existed. So we think that either famine or environmental causes were the reasons for the Olmecs kind of disappearing, and they just assimilated into other local native tribes. The Aztecs were in the area. They had created Teotihuacan, which was their major capital city. Um, and then you have the Mayans, who ruled from 300 to 900 CE. They were the heirs to the Olmec traditions. They took a lot of their traditions and their culture and assumed them. And a big reason for that is because a lot of the Olmecs got assumed into local Mayan tribes. They had city-states. Instead of having one giant unified country, they had city-states with individual kings and rulers, but they all were one giant empire. Their major cities were Tikal and Chichen Itza. And they advanced math and science in their time as an empire. These civilizations developed in isolation from the rest of the world. They had no influence from the outside world. So it's amazing that they, uh, that they developed at about the same time as the rest of the civilizations with very similar concepts and ideas. Also part of classical America was the Andes area, which is down um, on the western portion of South America. The Mochi were there down in South America. They had their empire from about 100 to 800 CE. Because they're in the mountain area, they had to use terrace farming, which was different, different planting areas on different like uh, plateaus, if you want to call it that. And they also had irrigation systems to help water their plants, very, very advanced. Um, and again, they were in the Andes Mountains. They also, um, the, they also domesticated the llama there. And they used the llama because the llamas were really good for mountain, mountain climbing and such. Moving on now to empires and states developing new techniques of imperial administration based in part on the successes of earlier political forms. So in order to organize their subjects, in many regions, the rulers had to create administrative institutions, which included centralized governments all in one place, as well as an elaborate legal system and bureaucracies, because it's very difficult to rule if you're not unified as one and you have separate rulers in different areas. You have to have a common set of laws and one centralized government in order to have one whole unified empire. Otherwise, you're just going to have your separate little rulers kind of competing for influence, and you're not going to have one really unified group. The imperial governments promoted trade and projected their military power over larger areas using a variety of techniques like diplomacy, going out and being kind to other empires. They developed supply lines. They also built fortifications um, and defensive walls and roads in order to protect their empires and their land. They drew new groups of military officers and soldiers from either right where they were in that location or their newly conquered populations as well. Much of the successes of the empires rested on their promotion of trade um, and economic integration by building and maintaining the roads and issuing currencies. So they were able to support these empires thanks to having these roads and these connections with the other areas.
You have unique social and economic dimensions that developed in imperial societies in Afro-Eurasia and the Americas. The cities would serve as centers of trade and public performance of religious rituals and political administrations for states and empires. So these cities became very, very important. The major ones that you need to know are there on the map. Um, so be aware of those specific cities that you see right there. You've got the unique and social and economic dimensions that developed in the imperial societies in Afro-Eurasia and the Americas. You've got these social structures of the empires which displayed hierarchies. Um, so these, these civilizations were not equal, where they were not egalitarian, where all people were considered equal. You had different social classes in each of the different groups. And you can see pictured there the Egyptian social hierarchy. As we all know, we've got the Indian social hierarchy with the caste system. In China, we all know that the merchants, they were considered lower than dirt because they were not doing anything meaningful. But in India, the merchants were considered much higher in social class. You have your priests usually up on a very high social class, your government officials up on a high social class, and your ultimate leader and religious leader up in your high classes. You also have imperial societies relying on a range of methods to maintain the production of food and provide rewards for the loyalty of the elite. The elite. You have corvée labor, which was unpaid labor for a limited period of time. You have slavery, which obviously is unpaid labor for life. You have rents and tributes being paid to the landlords and the elites. You have peasant communities in certain areas because that's where they were allowed to live. And people were measured by their family and household production. You have a patriarchy continuing to shape gender and family relations in all of the imperial societies of this period. Women were lacking in rights largely across the board. The Roman, the Han, the Persian, the Mauryan, and the Gupta empires all encountered political, cultural, and administrative difficulties that they ultimately couldn't manage, which also ultimately led to their decline, their collapse, and then their transformation into successor empires or states. So you have the excessive mobilization of resources, so it's moving all around the empire. You have imperial governments generating social tensions in areas and also creating economic difficulties by concentrating too much wealth in the hands of the elites. A lot of people weren't happy that all the wealth was in the hands of the elites and not being shared across the board. You also have external problems resulted from security issues along the frontiers. If you're too large, you can't possibly cover every bit of your borders. So unfortunately, you will have security issues, which includes the threat of invasions, and that ultimately challenges imperial authority. So you've got the Han China and the Qiangyu. Um, you also have the Gupta and the White Huns. Um, so the Gupta faced invasion by the White Huns. And the Romans had northern and eastern neighbors, barbarians, and also the Huns, um, coming and trying to take on their empire. Last key concept, 2.3, the emergence of the interregional networks of communication and exchange. So you've got organization of large-scale empires and the volume of long-distance trade because of that increased hugely. So a lot of this trade resulted from the demand for raw materials and luxury goods from specific places. So you have land and water routes linking many regions of the Eastern Hemisphere. And you have the exchange of people, technology, religious and cultural beliefs, food crops, domesticated animals, and disease developing alongside the trade in goods across these huge networks of communication and exchange. Um, the Americas and Oceania localized networks existed, but they obviously weren't connected to the major networks.
Billion and water routes became the basis for interregional trade, communication, and exchange networks in the Eastern Hemisphere. So you've got your Eurasian land routes on the map in purple. Your Silk Roads were in red. Your Indian Ocean trade routes are in that light blue. The Trans-Saharan routes um, are over in Africa in that yellow. And the Mediterranean Sea trade routes are in the green. You've got many factors, including climate and location of routes, the typical trade goods, and the ethnicity of the people involved shaping the distinctive features of all of those trade routes. So we'll talk a little bit about how each of those trade routes is. So the new technologies facilitated helped create this long distance communication exchange. You've got new technologies like yokes so that you could put animals together, saddles so you can now ride the animals, and also stirrups to help ride the animals that permitted the use of the domesticated pack animals like horses, oxen, llamas, and camels in order to transport goods across longer routes. Instead of having a human have to carry them with a cart, now you can have domesticated animals help carry them as well. You have innovations in maritime technologies like the t Latin sails, the compass, as well as advanced knowledge of the monsoon winds stimulating exchanges along the maritime routes from East Africa to East Asia. It was very difficult to travel in the Indian Ocean because you had to know about the monsoon wind patterns, um, which that was something that the Mediterranean Sea didn't necessarily have to deal with. They had to deal with winds, but not necessarily the monsoons, which were like hurricanes in the Indian Ocean. So alongside the trade in goods, you have the exchange of people, technology, religious and cultural beliefs, food crops, domesticated animals, disease pathogens, all that good stuff. So the spread of crops, which included rice and cotton from South Asia to the Middle East using the Silk Road, encouraged exchanges in farming and irrigation techniques. You, so they learned as they went to these different places. You can see the Kanat system pictured there, which was an irrigation system created um, for these farming techniques. Alongside, so more, more irrigation systems that were created, you have the Norius water wheel to lift water into an aqueduct in order to be saved for a larger city. So the wheels turn together to put the water into the aqueduct. And then you also have the Sakya or the Persian wheel, which was a mechanical water lifting device which used buckets that attached to a wheel in order to lift the water. You can see another image of the Sakya that shows you how the buckets kind of picked it up using the wheels um, and like the, the animal lover to help move the buckets and all those different wheels. Unfortunately, you also have the spread of disease pathogens, um, which helped to diminish urban populations um, and contributed to the decline of some of the empires, especially the Roman and the Han empires. So in Rome, you had the plague coming in and killing off a lot of people, and that kind of started the decline of the Roman Empire because it's hard to have a giant empire when you don't have the same. In Han, China, same thing happened. You had a plague coming in, smallpox and the measles, you have a lot of people dying, and it's hard to control the whole empire with a population. And it's also easy to say that they're vulnerable because people can come in, they see a weakness, they take over. So regional and cultural traditions also transformed as they spread. Christianity spread throughout Africa and the Mediterranean region. And Buddhism spread from India through the Silk Roads into China, into Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, um, all through these trade routes. And they also changed as they spread to kind of pick up the little local cultures that they saw. Hinduism also transformed as it spread throughout India and Asia.